Hi, it's great to be here. And more importantly, it's great to see all of you. It's pretty amazing. I've been in this room many times, but I have never seen so many women in this room. That's very amazing. Yeah. So let me tell you a little bit about myself because whenever you know, I look at you, I think about all the places and all the trajectories that your life will take. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about my own trajectory. Um, well, so I remember at the age of six asking my great-grandmother, what do you call a person who loves mathematics? And I said, is it a mather, a mathete, a magician? And she looked in the family dictionary, she said, the word is mathematician. And from that moment forward, that was all I ever wanted to be, was a mathematician. And it made perfect sense to me because my own personal life was pretty messy. I was being raised by my great grandparents. But in the world of mathematics, everything was nice and orderly. One plus one, at least at that time, was always two. <laughs> and I could just derive things and everything had a sort of made sense. Um, and so I soared in mathematics. I went uh, pretty soon in middle school, I was taking math classes at the local colleges. And then my great grandparents died. So my messy life got really messy. Um, I got a scholarship because of the, my math progress to Dana Hall School in Wellesley, Massachusetts. And Dana Hall is a boarding school. And I started taking, I exhausted their math classes pretty easily and I started taking courses at nearby Wellesley College. Yeah, shout out to Wellesley. I loved it there, that was fun too. Uh, but I was really young and I had a fake ID because when I got my Wellesley College ID, I told them the wrong age. Because back then the drinking age was 18. Oh, I'm not supposed to say that. Uh, anyway. <laughs> but uh, there was one math class I had never taken at Dana. At, uh, Dana. Oops, sorry. So there was one math class I'd never taken at Dana. So I signed up for it, and it was a class called Computer Science. And I don't know, what do they, I think they call it love, when all, no matter what the conversation, that's all you come back to. And I found myself spending all this time, all of my time in a closet, because that's where the computer was. Back then, it was really, not even a computer, it was a terminal that called the computer at Dartmouth. Uh, and uh, on which we did programming. And I was writing programs that did everything. Everything I loved about math, I found in, in that computer class. And it made sense too, because all of the, the logical sequencing and thinking that I enjoyed in math was there in programming, but, it had, but the computer had an advantage. And that was instead of just formulas and mathematics on a piece of paper, I could do things in the real world with the programs I wrote. And so from that point on, all I ever wanted to do was be a computer scientist. So that led me to eventually to the PhD program at MIT in computer science. And I was zipping along quite in love with being a computer scientist. And one day I walked through the lab and there was an ethicist. And just as I walked by, she tells, she, I hear her say, computers are evil. So I stop in my track. Clearly, I have to correct her thinking. <laughs> so uh, her name was Beverly Woodward. She's a professor at Brandeis. And she goes on this monologue about how uh, computers are changing everything. You know, she talks about the data that is leaving individual control and going out into the world and can harm people because they have no control over it. She gave this example that the Group Insurance Commission here in Massachusetts had taken all of the health records of state employees and their families uh, and sort of took off name and address and was giving it out pretty widely. And she said, now people will end up re-identifying the data, blackmailing judges and so forth, and how this was sort of the end of society as we knew it. So I tell her, no, I don't think that's right. I mean, you could just... It, you know, if they take off the name and address, maybe that's okay. And she said, well, is it? So I started doing a mathematical calculation in the back of my head. Three, there are 365 days in a year. Let's say people live 100 years and there are two genders. That's over 70,000 combinations. But I knew the typical five-digit zip code in the United States only had 20,000 people. That meant that the way they were releasing the information 
could actually re-identify individuals. The year is 1995. Um, and this actually was the normal way that information was released, not just medical data, all kinds of data, where the demographics remained the same, but it had no name and address. So I wanted to see if, if the sort of back of the envelope calculation was correct. So for $20, I walked over to the Cambridge City Hall and I got the Cambridge voter list. It came on two floppy diskettes. My, my eight-year-old son doesn't actually know what a floppy diskette is. But, um, but anyway, I could link on demographics because the voter list had demographics and it also had name. And so if you link this, you could put back the missing information. And the question would be, how unique would this matching be? So William Weld was the governor of Massachusetts at the time. Um, and he lived here in Cambridge, so he was in the voter list. In fact, only six people had his date of birth, only three of them were men, and he was the only one in his five-digit zip code. So those demographics, date of birth, gender, and zip code, were unique for him. And then I did another calculation and found that it's unique for about 87% of the people in the United States. So one day I'm a graduate student sitting there trying to convince this ethicist that she's wrong about technology when in some ways she sort of had enlightened me. And in that moment, I didn't realize it, but that my life is gonna take a huge turn. Uh, within a month or so, I'm down in Congress testifying before congressional bodies because it wasn't just this data set that was being shared that way. It was all data sets, that was the norm. And, it ha and this conversation happened exactly at the time that uh, society was, American society was debating what became known as the HIPAA privacy rule. So the, my work is actually talked about in the preamble of the law, so that was kind of cool. Uh, and, but don't blame me for HIPAA. I'm not responsible for what they actually wrote the law to be. I'm just saying that uh, that, that glimpse was sort of the start. It was the start of my career, but it was also the start of the beginning of a new era that people don't realize so much anymore, or don't realize yet. And that is that the technology that you design really dictates the rules that society lives by. That technology design really is sort of the new policy maker. We don't elect them to office, we don't know their names, but an arbitrary decision they make can determine how we're gonna live our lives. Let me give you some examples. This is what a camera looked like. At the time, American jurisprudence was trying to decide what the rules were gonna be for photographing people in public. And so they decided, and so it came out that, well, you can photograph anyone in a public space and you don't need their permission. You can photograph them freely. And this is what a, this is what a phone looked like when American jurisprudence was trying to decide what were gonna be the rules by which people could record phone conversations. And it turned out that the answer was you needed at least one party's consent. And in some states, you need all parties' consent in order to actually record the phone conversation. Then in 1982, out came this device. Anybody know what it is? <laughs> yes, a camcorder. Um, my eight-year-old son does not know what that is. <laughs> The Sony camcorder was the first uh, mass market device that recorded both video and sound. And it did so in a way that had no mute button. That is, once you're recording, you're recording video and sound together. And that's totally in, that totally messes up the division that American jurisprudence had had. And so in no time at all, interesting cases started coming forward. There was a mother in Pennsylvania who strapped one of those things to her child and, she, and was able to record sort of obscenities and other horrible actions that this bus driver was having against her child. She takes the video to the local police, they turn around and they arrest her for illegal wiretapping because she had recorded sound without his permission. There was a case here in Boston where a Boston University police officer was arresting uh, a protester. Another protester had a camcorder and he pulls out the camcorder and starts videotaping the police officer. The police officer stops arresting the one guy, turns around and arrests the guy uh, who was doing the videotaping 
arrest him on felony charges of illegal wiretapping, which has a seven-year prison sentence. That particular case in Pennsylvania ended up with a new law that it's okay. In fact, now Pennsylvania school buses, uh, almost all of them now have videos on them. The situation here in Boston of that young, uh, the young protester who did the videotaping uh, ended up being changing our laws such that now we do have the right to record public officials in the service of their duties. And so when you see the videos like Black Lives Matter and, and, uh, that you see in the under, that are being part of the Black Lives Matter protests, that's sort of why you, it's okay to do that. So it's kind of interesting, this arbitrary mute button missing on a camcorder ended up changing our laws. We ended up changing our laws to satisfy it. And you know what else is interesting? Today, I don't know of a single cell phone that, well, most of the cell phones record video, but I don't know of a single one of them that has a mute button. So we also tend to replicate what works, or if it works, I'm not sure. This is a sleep number bed. The sleep number bed is an air ma mattress system. And so the idea is you can, set, uh, you can set how the firmness based on how much air gets pumped into it. One of their new features now is called Sleep IQ and it has a layer of sensors throughout the bed and they're highly sensitive. And so the idea is while you're sleeping, it's taking various measurements on how much you move when you're in the bed, how much you turn around, um, and various other kind of types of measurements. And then that information leaves your home through the internet. And uh, the next morning, you can go onto a website or use an app, and it'll tell you how well you slept. That's one design decision. Here's another. This is an Apple uh, watch. I have one as well. And it too wants to tell me how well I'm doing, like when I, when I need to get up and stand up and so forth. But its architecture is different. Instead of the information about me going to a website outside of my home, it just goes to my local cell phone. And that decision is a radically different in terms of consequences for me. But notice it's also really different around what two worlds those different designs of technology have on all of us. So I do put forward to you that we do live in a technocracy, that the technology that you design, that you will design, that the companies that you'll work for and will design will really dictate the world and the rules by which we live. But sometimes it can go really wrong. So let me give you an example. One day I was talking to a reporter uh, in my office and I wanted to show him an old paper. So we went to Google my name, and yes, I still do that. Google is a verb. I, I'm determined to make Google a verb. Um, so I Googled my name, and up pop uh, some ads. And the ads, uh, were, many of them were like this. They suggested that I had an arrest record. I sort of ignored the ads and point to the link to the paper that he and I were looking for. And he says, well, forget that paper. Tell me about that arrest. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> I said, well, I haven't been arrested. And he said, well, then why does it say you have? And I said, well, I haven't been. And so we started Googling around with other names. And every time we would use a person's name whose first name was Latanya, we would get these ads suggestive of arrest. So right away, he, he's a white Italian guy, white Italian American. And he says, oh, it's because you got one of those black sounding names. <laughs> And I said, that's ridiculous on two levels. One, I don't know what you're talking about with a black sounding name. And two, that's not how computers work. They're not gonna take the time to figure out how to send me an ad suggestive of arrest and not send someone else. So I said, let me prove it to you. So I then typed in my first name and uh, hit images and I saw all of these black faces, right? And we began, and then when I type in Tanya, I see all of these white faces. So there's clearly something to this black sounding name. So, but I'm still determined to show him that he's not quite right. So the more we, so I paid the money and joined, paid to get into Instant Checkmate. And not only did I not have an arrest record, but these other Latanyas didn't, ha they didn't have an arrest record for them either. And there were other white names that we had searched uh, that didn't say suggestive of arrest, that did have these sort of arrest records. 
And so eventually, I'm determined to prove him wrong, so I do this full blown out study where I basically capture 140,000 of these ads. These ads appear on real names, so I had to dig out real names of real people. Um, and the way I did that was uh, I, to operationalize this black sounding name thing, uh, I basically realized that there are names given at birth to black babies much more often than they are to white babies. And there are names given to white babies much more often than they are to black babies. And so there really is a sort of quantifiable notion of a black sounding name, or at least a black assigned name. Anyway, um, so I do this, I do this for 140,000 ads. And I find out that 80% uh, of the time, if you have a, a black a name whose first have a name whose first name is more often given to black babies, that you're more likely to get this arrest ad, and you don't when it's given the opposite. And so this was pretty amazing. So then we say, so now the question is, how come this is happening? How is it? that Google's ad network, which has all of these bids on one side, is going to decide in a fraction of a second which ad's going to get replaced. Where exactly is this bias happening? It's a very costly experience for Google to be messing around in that cloud to actually try to care about sending me an arrest ad. Adam wasn't convinced of that, so I had to dig deeper. So it, tur so it turns out the uh, company claimed uh, that they had put the same ad on every American's name. And what they mean by that is that they had written five versions of text. Some of them implied an arrest record, and some of them they claimed were neutral. And the way the Google Ad Network works is you, if, as the advertiser, you give it the uh, co content of your, the content you want delivered, you give it the, what it is on the search string you want your ad to be displayed with, and then you say how much you're willing to pay if somebody clicks on that ad. The algorithm is a learning algorithm. Its job is to optimize time. It may, so at first it starts out, it randomly will pick one of these. And, but over time, depending on which ad gets clicked, that's the ad that's going to get displayed more often. Now under that model, it seems as though society was making this choice. That is, people would click arrest more often for black sounding names than they would for white sounding names. Um, and um, so, so that was the position of the company. But later I found out when I worked for the Federal Trade Commission, they got wha whacked with a fine and Google no longer allows these kinds of ads. So I'm not really sure that they were evenly distributed as he pointed, as, as the uh, owner was trying to say, as much as there may have been bias here. But it was really interesting that that could actually be, that it could happen. That is that we can design algorithms that have this sort of feedback learning aspect to it, and it can exhibit bias and how do you find it. One of the things that made this particular experiment uh, kind of eye-catching in DC was the Justice Department. They had never thought about how do you go about enforcing laws on technology. So we have a law, we have a law called the Civil Rights Act in the United States. So discrimination is not illegal. Uh, many of you probably got here on a, some kind of student discount to get in or something like that. So clearly discrimination is not illegal. And soon, with all the gray hair I have, I will take advantage of, uh, of discounts for the elderly. I have a few years left, I'm just saying. Uh, so discrimination is not illegal. But what the Civil Rights Act says is that it is illegal to discriminate against protected groups under certain circumstances. So one of those protected groups, in fact, are, are African Americans. And one of those protected areas is employment. And so most, very often, if you apply for a job, they're going to go online and try to find out things about you. And so if there are two people going for a job, and one comes up with ads that are very suggestive of arrest, and the other one doesn't, it does, in fact, create what's called a disparate impact. And it doesn't matter whether it was intentional or not, it's still considered a violation. And the, dis the disparity has to be 80-20, which was exactly what we had seen with the ads. So this was sort of the first time that 
we, that uh, the federal government realized a sort of an operational way to look at um, the fairness of algorithms. This created, this sort of went like wildfire around the federal government, created a, spawned a whole new group of researchers in computer science who work on the concept of algorithmic fairness, how do we design algorithms that are fair, and so forth. And so it's sort of a whole new subfield. But for our purpose, it also says that that's not a privacy issue, right? So privacy was the first wave. That here we're talking about civil rights and so forth. It seems as though every democratic value is actually up for grabs by what technology allows or doesn't allow. Let me give you another example, even though, um, and this one comes from a different aspect. This is, um, the, this is a newspaper called the Pittsburgh Courier. It's the oldest black newspaper in the United States, and in its heyday, it had hundreds of thousands of subscribers. And if you wanted to run an ad in the Pittsburgh Courier, they had an editorial staff who had to approve the ad copy that you delivered to make sure that it was appropriate. This is what the Pittsburgh Courier looks like today. It's only an online presence, and its ads are delivered by Google Ad Network. So when I went to the FTC, one of the things we were interested in is what is the ad experiences of different groups? You know, American Indians, young people, older people, fam people who have children in their home, people who don't. Because when you look at the top websites in, that everyone visits, they're kind of all the same. You know, the Facebook, Google, Facebook, Google and so forth. But after you get around number 11 or 12, they deviate radically based on your demographics, based on your interests. And, the, and so that your total web experience for any two arbitrary people pulled out of the population are not at all the same. And so we wanted to capture that. What is the, an online web experience like for a group of people? So we did lots of these. This is an example of a black fraternity uh, who was having its 100th year anniversary and we wanted to know what ads got delivered on the website. So we saw uh, business ads, uh, we, we saw ads for graduate school, which was clearly uh, quite appropriate. We saw ads for social events and going on trips and so forth. We also saw these kinds of ads as well, sort of a kind of unwanted ad. And we, saw, uh, we also saw variations of those. And we also saw ads for credit cards. So this is an ad for the first premier credit card. And so the Federal Trade Commission is kind of the de facto police of the internet um, because it basically deals with dece deceitful and unfair practices. And since most American, so most internet companies and high tech companies are American companies, the FTC becomes sort of the police of the internet. But the FTC also is responsible for credit card reporting and issues are along that. And so here we had these credit card ads. So we said, well, how does that credit card ad, all of the credit card ads that we saw appear on the site, how do they compare to other credit card ads? So sort of on the left side are sort of the worst credit cards and on the right side are the best credit cards. And on the website, we only saw the worst possible credit cards. So that creates a kind of disparity based on credit opportunity. But we, we ask a different question too. On the right, we said, where are all the places American Express Blue appears? American Express Blue, by anyone's standard, is pretty much the most highly praised credit card. And these first premier card is probably the worst card. If you have a first premier card, please try to get rid of it, I'm just saying. <laughs> But what we saw here was really interesting. As you look on the right at the places that the American Express card appeared, you definitely get an educational theme, which begged the question, why didn't we see those ads on Omega Sci-Fi? And it's kind of, we're not sure how to characterize the ones we saw on the left. So I think with those examples, um, not only can we say that every kind of value, and I can give you many other values in, in our, uh, in our country where we've been able to demonstrate these kinds of effects. Most recently, we've been working on election vulnerability. I'm not gonna talk about that right now unless it comes up in question and answer. But I do wanna say that, that we have evidence that all of these democratic values are kind of all up for grabs right now. 
But what was interesting about the work that I did at the FTC and what was interesting about the uh, online ad work was that it also showed that once I could shore up and, and figure a way to use technology or use an experiment to illuminate how it was impacting, it became very powerful. That is, the Department of Justice now had a way to check on how to enforce their activities for online activity. We also did fraud and other things at the FTC. Let me give you another example um, from my own work. I, I became interested at one point, so I'm the director of the Data Privacy Lab, a lab that I started at Carnegie Mellon, and then when I moved to, the, uh, to Harvard, it moved with me. And it's done all kinds of work. And at some point, we, be, we began to ask the question, I wonder where all the places my medical records go? You know, so if you think about it, you might think, here's information I'm giving to my doctor, my doctor's recording, where else might it go? And if we were to do a quick survey, most people would probably name these entities. Well, the insurance company needs it, and the hospital might need it, and so forth. But we were able to document that actually that a copy of your medical record goes to all, over 2,000 different places. And so we have categorized them by type. If you actually visit the site, you can click on one of these nodes and it'll identify exactly what company and why we say that company uh, has received or is giving uh, your personal medical record. And one of the things then, once we had built this, that became really interesting is how many of those flows aren't even covered by HIPAA. So here we have this medical privacy law. We think of it as being comprehensive, but in fact, it didn't even account for half of the flows of information that we were able to document. That means that those flows of information totally are, not, are open turf for companies. They're open turf for technology and how it works. So we began looking even closer at this middle point, this discharge data. Does anybody here know what dis hospital discharge data is? Uh, one sort of weak. Well, let me ask you a different way. Has anybody here ever been to a doctor's office or a hospital? Okay, then your records are in the discharge data. So basically every state has passed a law demanding a copy of all of the, of the, the hospital claim that would go to the insurance company, a copy of it goes to the state. Um, and, then this, and, it's, and that's what discharge data represents. So of the 50 states that collect discharge data, 33 of them either sell it or give it away. And so these are the states, if your state is up there, you'll know not only did they get a copy, whether or not they also sell it or give it away. But selling or giving it away may not be much of a problem if they are at least, even though they're not covered by HIPAA, maybe they at least adhere to HIPAA. But it turns out only three of them do. So that's kind of alarming. And <clears throat> so when we began to ask the various state, states about it, they posed the question, well, maybe HIPAA's too strong. Maybe it's more damage, too tight. Maybe it's more work than is needed. Maybe you don't have to have all of that. So for $50, we purchased the uh, 2011 hospital discharge. That would be every hospital visit in the state of Washington. And we wanted to see whether or not we could actually re-identify individuals, sort of a, a jump back to my, the way I started. Could I figure out whose data this might be? The, the number of fields in the data was about 300. But this is just a few, just to give you a sense of the kind of information it contains. It doesn't contain name or address. It does, down at the bottom, have some demographics, gender, five-digit zip code, age and month and years, and diagnosis and sort of how the bill was paid, what the total bill was, and so forth. And so here at Harvard, they have this art on the online library, subscribe to an archive of newspapers. Uh, and so some of the newspapers in the state of Washington were in that archive. So we pulled up news stories, and what we wanted to know was could we figure, how many of these we could figure out was which person, right? So a lot of the news stories would be things about incidents, stabbings, burglaries, anything that created a situation where the individual may have to go to the hospital. In this particular case, uh, this guy is on a motorcycle, he gets in a motorcycle accident, and he has to go to the hospital. 
So we know his name because the stories tend to tell us what his name is. The question is, how do we find his record among the millions of records that are there? Year to year, uh, I'm sorry, age to age, uh, we can plot location to where he was from. We know the date of the news article, so we can pull out which of those, um, which of the records would match an appearance in the hospital at that time, which of them, when the person arrived at the hospital, matches the description that's in the text. And we were able to do this for almost half of the records that were, half of the stories that we found. So we had 81 stories from the archive. We were able to do a direct match on 43. And by direct match, I don't even mean statistical matching. I mean literally that the pieces had to be exact. A reporter from Bloomberg News uh, then uh, visited each one of those, contacted each of them, and found that we were 100% correct. So, so what happened then was you can imagine the woman who is an epidemiologist who ran the hospital discharge data in the state of Washington gets a phone call from me that says, I just re-identified all your data. And she goes on and she explains, well, I'm sorry, that's the best we can do because we have a law in Washington state that requires us for oversight purposes to release the data. And the fact that every, even if everyone was re-identified in the data, unless we change the law, there's nothing we can do. Three months later, because of the experiment, the law was changed. So, this, so when we look back over these examples, the William Weld example, uh, having an impact on HIP, shaping HIPAA, we look back on the uh, discrimination in online ads having an impact on the Department of Justice and spawning a new area in computer science study. As we look back on all of these, we learn that these single experiments, one simple idea, didn't require so much about us having new policies as much as finding a way to help the helpers, to help the system simply work. So when I came back to Harvard, I was really inspired to take students and have them do exactly that. Because really, you know what, it's not rocket science to do these experiments, right? Well, I'd like to think I'm smart, but you know, the truth is they're, they're not all that, right? And so the question is, could we get students to do the same thing? Could they find vulnerabilities, unforeseen consequences, formulate it so that it was a scientific finding and to have impact? So, so in other words, could we get students to kind of save the world? I'm one person, but could I take a whole group? So the class that I taught called Data Science to Save the World that semester, I told the students, I said, look, we're going to, um, if any of you do a really good job with your term project at the end of the year, I'll take you down to DC and give you an audience with regulators. And I thought about three students would be taking that trip with me and put aside that amount of money. But at the end of the term, 26 students had crossed the threshold to do these amazing projects. So we took all 26 students down to Washington, D.C., and, we, and each, each student project had a poster, and the, and the students would stand by their posters, and the regulators would come in, and they would talk to them. And it was supposed to last for two hours, but it went for almost four. And it was, a high, it was just so energetic. The students were excited. The regulators were excited. You know, the typical regulator is a man around 50 years old who, could not, who had never even heard of some of the apps that the students were talking about. And, and the regulators were so inclined because they were learning from the students. The students were excited because they were having real world impact. So when we left there, we said, oh, we shouldn't let it end here we should have the students write papers, publish papers. We should start a new journal idea. So the new journal idea we came up with was called the Harvard Papers on Technology Science. This was kind of aimed up to the way law schools write papers. That is, the, uh, a lot of times students in law schools will write papers and they'll have their own law journal and it's school specific. So that was our model. But Harvard said, oh, you can't use our name unless you get somebody outside of Harvard to say the papers are good enough to have Harvard's name. 
I'm like, well, I can give them a grade, but I can't set, put the, say that they came from Harvard. I don't know. It was very confusing, but I went along with this plan. So I go to my email. I pull up the names of 50 researchers around the world. I, I'm looking for a few of them to vet these papers. When I emailed 50, 48 of them said yes. So when 48 researchers around the world says yes, that's not a Harvard thing. That's not a LaTanya thing. That's a thing. <laughs> so we dropped all the Harvard and stuff like that, and we launched the Journal of Technology Science. Students published there, established scholars, researchers, lawyers, across discipline study uh, published there. The papers have had a profound impact. And of course, the very first papers that were published there were those papers from those, from those 26 students. So let me give you a little, tell you a little bit about them and the impact that they had. <clears throat> this is a paper by Daniel Rothschild. He's a senior now, actually. Um, and when he took the class, he was interested in trying to change the way the Federal Trade Commission did fraud. So the way fraud works at the FTC is kind of a chase them after the fact proposition. Um, so basically, you're being defrauded out of something, you yell and scream and call the FTC, and eventually there's enough cases that they say, oh, I think something's going on. And they go and they look, and especially if it's online, by the time they go to chase down the fraudster, the fraudster's long gone. So the, so the uh, actual results in these kinds of online fraud cases was close to zero, right? So, so Daniel had the idea, well, hey, wait a second. If, we, if they tell us what kind of uh, frauds are happening, I can just use some keywords out of the kinds of ways people talk about the fraudulent ads, and I'll search Twitter in real time for the existence of these ads. And so he did it, and it worked. And now the FTC has updated and modernized a bit his original program, but this is actually what they use now. And not only that, it... Um, it totally transformed the way they did fraud. Instead of chasing someone down, they're able to see right now that ad is happening and be able to catch fraudsters uh, up front. This is another paper uh, by Keon Christian and some others. And they were interested in price discrimination. Um, and they had, one of them had actually taken Princeton Review to improve their SAT scores. They had subscribed to the online service of Princeton Review. And they had noticed that in order to get a price, you have to type in a zip code first. So they mined out the prices for all of the zip codes uh, for the same online service. And, and when you look at it at scale, you can see those of us in New England pay the highest price, for example, and that the prices do change as we go across the country. But, it's not, but if you blow up and you start to look at exactly which communities, exactly which zip codes are paying higher prices within these areas, you find out that, if you're, if, uh, that an Asian family is almost twice the price. So um, this has also created a lot of stir. They end up on the Today Show, uh, among other things. And Christian uh, went on to be uh, to Silicon Valley and has started one of those um, Y Combinator companies that had got fully funded. This is a study uh, by John Gilhaney and some others. Uh, they were interested in um, prices on Airbnb. So there are a professor, some professors at the business school had done a similar study and found now that black hosts in New York City uh, didn't make as much for comparable property in comparable neighborhoods as did white hosts. So they repeated it in California and found a disparity of 20% between white hosts and Asians. And Airbnb responded pretty promptly, and so now they have a whole recommended price system as a way to combat this problem. Let me just give you a couple more. Many of you may have heard about Iran. Um, Iran took the class, and for many years, for at least two or three years, before Iran ever stepped into the class, um, there had been this known vulnerability in Facebook Messenger, and then specifically that it would leak the, the GPS location of the person sending messages in Facebook Messenger. And so you could actually uh, take these, uh, take the, uh, past messages, 
pull out the GPS locations and sort of plot where the person is throughout their day or, or throughout time. So he made a web plugin that would do, a browser plugin that would do just that. And so he puts it online, he gets about 90, almost 90,000, 85,000 downloads. And it's, the news stories just start, they started in Europe and they come back around and it was like everywhere, it was a huge story. And so by day nine, Facebook changes this, fixes the, I say fixes the bug, they say change the feature. <laughs> but in any case, clearly Iran's, it seems as though Iran bringing it to public exposure, what that vulnerability is, had a huge impact. The reason Iran ends up with a TED talk though and an article in Time Magazine and the covers uh, on various uh, newspapers is because he had been given a summer job at Facebook. And so, this, so he goes to Facebook, they wait till the day before he's to show up, and he gets a phone call that says, we're not gonna hire you. And, um, and so, like, I think within, by the end of that day, he then had a summer job that was almost, they, I think he got almost twice as much money as Facebook was offering. So he, he ends up in a great spot but it was pretty amazing to see the, um, a bad decision by a middle manager for Facebook. But that bad decision really exalted the public um, coverage of this. I don't want, there's many more stories to be told, in, including uh, impact on the Affordable Care Act. Um, Eugene and Grace um, took, they were the first to look at the data when the health exchanges came online. Out. And, uh, and they noticed that when the large companies came in, the prices soared. So right away, uh, the paper got published and right away, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid passed new guidance about what does it take for it to raise your prices under the Affordable Care Act. So there are a lot of stories and you can visit techscience.org yourself and read of them. But more importantly than that is that each of those papers are really about you. This talk is not really about me, it's about you. It's about how you can change the world too. How anything that these students have done, you can do. You can do it either through the job that you'll take on, you can do it through the thesis that you'll do, you can do it through the research that you, that, uh, that you might undertake. But the point is that you have a lot of power in your hands because of your passion for technology and your desires. So I just want to say you too can save the world. Thank you. I think we have time for a couple of questions. Just a really good one. Any chance there's an online version of the course I teach? Any chance there's an online version of the course I teach? Not yet, but we're working on it. But, if you, but in your school, it's very likely that one of the 50 researchers who show up as an editor on tech science, if, you, if, you have a, if, if, if you're in one of those schools, it's a lot easier for us to connect you with someone who's doing that work. Yes? With apps and new technology, oh, thank you. Oh. With apps and new technology that have your health information that you can link to other sites like Facebook via Fitbit and things like that, are you sacrificing your security because of the other company or like your privacy of information? Well, I think most people would say yes, but the question is what is the harm? And, and the bigger question is can you demonstrate it? Can you come up with an experiment to demonstrate it? And we could kind of noodle on what that might be. Hi. I think this will be the last question. People uh, hi. Um, I was wondering, so like when you do your research and find out like this data about certain companies and you like call them out on it or whatever, do they or are you informing them of that? You know? we, we do inform them. It's sort of good practice to give them a chance to either correct the situation or be able to manage it. Okay. Thank okay. you. All right, thank you very much. Enjoy your time at WeCode.